uh, in the Bible, and that surprises me when sometimes, again, I would never say this in, in a way to belittle yeah, anybody's yeah, religion, no, but, but when somebody throws these stones out of a glass Absolutely. house, right? We say that this doesn't show that the religion is false, Yeah. by the way. I mean, it's not an argument against the religion, because all we're doing is, from a philosophical perspective, we're using our socially constructed 21st century Western norms, and we're pitting them against the um, biblical, the Quranic, whatever narrative. And what that is, it actually constitutes a fallacy called the fallacy of presentism. Mm -hmm. The fallacy of presentism is using present ideas of the 21st century narrative to try and actually disprove other things which are moral based. Um, well, that's actually anachronistic. In other words, you're using a present idea to superimpose it on, a, let's say, a previous society or whatever it is. But that doesn't show that your idea is true and their idea is false. Mm -hmm. It just shows that you, you have a value judgment, a subjective aesthetic value judgment, which happens to differ from that which existed pre, uh, beforehand. But in any rate, I mean, at uh, any rate, I mean, a lot of these things are misconceptions. Like you were mentioning the verse in the uh, in the Quran about beating and these things. Mm -hmm. and, and just to kind of quickly summarize this verse, it's it's really interesting because this verse starts off um, by saying, it's, it's chapter four, verse thirty-four. It says, "وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ نُشُوزُهُنَّ فَعِذُهُنَّ وَهِجُرُهُنَّ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ عُضْرِبُهُنَّ." So, وَإِنْ أَطَعْنَكُمْ فَلَا فَلَا تَبَغُوا عَلَيْهِنَّ سَبِيلًا. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you fear their nushuz, i.e. Your, your wives, your nushuz is rebellion, and it can take different forms. Now, the first thing I would say to someone who's asking this question is as follows, really. I mean, I would say to someone, let's say, for example, who is, um, I'm not going to say a feminist, or someone who's, who believes in women's rights, anyone, right? Say to them, do you accept, do you believe that in all cases, in all cases, a man, a husband, can never touch a woman against her will in all cases absolute uh, absolutely all cases she, she might say yeah i don't believe in any case it's justified for a woman to touch her husband against his will uh, to, uh, sorry her husband to touch her wife against her will in any physical way so i'll say okay fine what if she is um what if she's killing the child or or endangering the child's health in a dramatic way and by the way this is not an um an anomalous example because if you find the nspcc which is a british uh, charity which deals with children's health and things like that it actually reported that the majority of fatalities or deaths of children are from from women because just not because the women are worse than men or more evil than men or uh, as the bible indicates in genesis but it's actually because um, women have more interaction time with uh, with with their ch with children with their children generally speaking as mothers mothers have more interaction time with their children so this is actually a real uh, case study if we see a mother because we're here looking at the philosophical or epistemological roots. If you see a mother, if a husband sees uh, his wife abusing the ch child, is he allowed to intervene and phys uh, physically touch a woman against her will? So, yeah, the, the feminists will turn around and say, yeah, probably. Uh, we're not objecting to that. So fine. So now we have to understand that we've broken the original thing that we've said, because originally we said that absolutely no, yeah, th there is no case in which a woman can, a man can touch a woman against her will. So, but then the woman will say, okay, well, uh, but that's, a, that's an exceptional circumstance. We say, all right, so you're saying in certain exceptional circumstances, m husbands can touch a woman physically against her will. That's very interesting. Say if she's hitting him, she's attacking him in a violent way, which could cause harm. Because women, despite popular uh, stereotypical understanding, might be weaker than men physically, but they're not completely incapable of hurting a man. So say, for example, she grabs a, a, a weapon or she physically tries to attack him. Is he allowed to defend himself and physically touch her against her will in that context. So let's say a fair-minded uh, feminist will say, yeah, okay, he can, do, he can do as much as it needs, as, as, as uh, he needs in order to get her off him. So I would say that if that is the case, then we've agreed already. And then say, why, why is that? Why have we agreed? So, well, the reason why we've agreed is actually because this verse is not telling a man how to beat up his wife. It's not. In fact, the Prophet explicitly told us in a hadith in Tirmidhi, do not hit the women's servants of Allah. Do not hit them. So if anyone says, okay, well, Islam's normative position is to go and hit the wives to discipline them or something. This is against the, the Quranic and Islamic or Hadith uh, narrative. This verse is not telling a man how to uh, hit or beat up his wife. This is telling how a, ma a man or a husband how to defend himself against his wife. Because the thing is, the nature of man is that a man is prone to in a, in a more biological predetermined way 
to, to a kind of aggressive behavior. So this Quranic injunction, these three steps, warn, abstain from sexual intercourse, and then you can apply daraba, which we can explain later on, or I've already explained in a couple of videos of mine, which we don't, maybe I don't want to descope this, uh, this discussion. Then you can do this, right? So, so someone might argue that, how comes it's not mentioned, this word is not mentioned in relation to women? I would say actually it is mentioned in relation to women, the same word. In chapter 4, I think verse 28, 128, 126 or 128, it says, وَإِنِ مِنْ بَعْلِهَا نُشُوزًا أَوْ إِعْرَادًا فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْهِمَا أَيْ يَصَلَّحَ بَيْنَهُمَا صُلْحَ وَصُلْحُ خَيْرٍ it says that if a woman fares from her husband nushuz or i'rad. I'rad means um, being neglected. So there's two things. Whereas in the verse in 434, there's only one, one thing that was mentioned, which was nushuz, which was rebellion. Here there are two things that are mentioned. Then she can start a reconciliation uh, with her husband. And she can start a reconciliation. And she actually has a right at any point to go to a, a, a qadi. She, she has a right to uh, a, a judge. If, she, if there's actually any damage done to her, she can get a divorce instantaneously. Any physical, actual physical damage we're not talking about you know something which is not uh, substantive or something which is not real or, or whatever it may be or he hurt her when he was rolling in the bed when he's sleeping or something like this no we're talking about some serious stuff that at any point yeah she could she could actually start a reconciliation process she could start a case against him the question will be made now so why is it the case that with a man is mentioned um Dalaba is mentioned which is a kind of physical recourse and it's not mentioned with a woman the answer is because men are physically more a more prone to violence, and so there needed to be some kind of refining or, or a, a cap put on what a man's normative or default position would uh, otherwise be, anyways. And number two is because if that same injunction was used for for a woman, it would put her in a disadvantageous position because actually, if a woman uh, uh, you know initiates something physical with a man and the man responds, yeah, uh, in what he would in many cases, perceive as self-defense, then she'd be put in a disadvantageous position in which he, uh, he can harm her physically. Mm -hmm. So really, the Quranic discourse is not one, because the, Quran, the, the Hadith says of the Prophet, in the قرجل, that certainly men are equal to women. By the way, the scholars say that this means equal. It means that uh, they're twins or whatever, but it also means equal. In the قرجل, generally speaking, we believe in the general equality. But there are certain situations yeah, where we believe that actually a man has a certain um, right over a woman and a woman sometimes has a certain right over a man like in the custody of children, like as mothers, she's three times more important than the man like in mahr, which is a dowry uh, like in, in many cases in divorce, she can preoccupy the house he lives in for three months it's his house but she has to stay there there's so many things we can, we can actually uh, list that a woman has a right over a man in uh, uh, and the opposite is also true in Islam. So mm -hmm. th there are some exceptional circumstances. And by the way, this is not even against um, Western society because frankly, Western civilization has made exceptions for women in certain things, maternity leave, uh, the army. There's, a dra there's been so many drafts for men to go to the army. There's no uh, all women draft in the history of uh, America, really. But there's been all women uh, armies. So there's so many things here we can say. But the point is, in a nutshell, a lot of these misconceptions is because they're approaching the Qur'an with their lenses, right? And if, if they want to have a genuine understanding of the Qur'an, they have to understand the Qur'an from what it's telling us rather than what we're trying to superimpose on, on, on it.